thanks. Uh, so I also want to thank the organizers and thanks to all of you for sticking around until the bitter end. Um, so uh, what I want to talk to about today is kind of a, a related, uh, two related problems that are kind of a, a particular application where we want to do learning. Um, so it's it's kind of in some ways very similar to the last talk, uh, but also in some ways a, a little different because I am going to approach this problem more from a kind of statistical estimation perspective and a little bit less from a, the perspective of computation. And I actually, I think there probably are uh, very important computational questions. Maybe some of these already have answers, but uh, that's not exactly going to be the focus. So what, I'm, what I am going to talk about is, uh, oh, I guess before I go further, I should just mention that the work I'm going to be talking about is, is uh, primarily the work of, of my students. So Andy uh, is a graduate student. He's going to graduate soon, hopefully. Um, and Matt is actually an, an undergraduate who's just starting uh, graduate school. So, okay, so the problem I want to really focus on is this problem where um, we want to estimate some vector, say x. And I'll think of x as just being a vector uh, in a k-dimensional space. Uh, and what we're going to get to observe are paired comparisons. So the idea is that uh, we're going to take our x and then we're going to observe a bunch of comparisons. We say, OK, uh, I have these pairs, I guess, pi and qi. And what I'm going to get to see is, is the x that I'm trying to estimate closer to pi or closer to qi? Which one of these two things is, is the closest? So uh, the picture you should have in mind is that I've got some set of points. And I know what these are. we will talk about where they come from later. But uh, so I have these points. These are. Uh, what we're going to be comparing against. And so we'll pick two of them and say which one of them is closer to x. And so maybe in this case it was on this side. So uh, we, we kind of now have uh, reduced our search space uh, in some sense. So now we pick another pair of points and we can think about repeating this process until we have a pretty good uh, idea of where, where our point must live. And OK. so. The kind of question I'm going to be interested in, in is how many comparisons do we need to get certain kinds of accuracy guarantees on, on how accurate uh, or on uh, you know, basically like the size of this region. Or, or if we have noise, maybe there'll be some other uh, measure. But basically, how, how accurately can we estimate this point just from comparisons of this sort? So there are lots of places where this uh, comes up. I'm going to focus just for kind of organizing your thoughts and having a concrete example. Uh, in your mind. I'm going to focus on recommendation systems as a, an example where this makes a lot of sense. Because this idea of, of kind of having an embedding of points and then saying, I want to know where some new point is located with respect to those uh, existing points uh, kind of falls out naturally of one of the very popular ways of mathematically modeling uh, a person's preference. So the idea is that uh, I have a kind of a silly example here that I think illustrates a few points. So imagine we looked at all of the drinks on the menu at like Starbucks. Uh, and there are going to be more than two features in reality, but I'll, I'll assume that we're only going to track kind of two features. One is how much sugar has been added, and one is how much milk has been added. And so it kind of spans the, the space. So some people want coffee black. Some people want things that just have incredible amounts of milk added to it, uh, and similar with sugar. Uh, and so maybe, uh, uh, maybe if you looked at me, I don't. This is not really true, but uh, so maybe I like a, you know a little bit of sugar added to it, uh, and a lot of of milk. And so we can kind of think of uh, each individual as having some what's called an ideal point, which kind of represents the ideal combination of uh, features for them. And then how much they like an item, so how much I like these other drinks, is going to be basically proportional in some sense to how far away that drink is from, from my ideal point. So this, uh, this has a, a number of features uh, that, that make people kind of like it. So this is viewed as a more powerful model than uh, what you may have may be more familiar with if you know a little bit about how recommendation systems or the existing literature on recommendation systems, a lot of it focuses on uh, low rank matrix factorizations that basically you can think of uh, all of the users and, and items as being, uh, you know, you can represent their prefer the preference of every user for every item as uh, 
some number in a matrix, and then uh, we think believe there's some sort of low rank factorization of that matrix that we can use to predict how, how much a user likes an item. So what's kind of lacking about that model is that it, it basically, if you think about it for a while, it induces sort of a monotonic preference function of all of the features. So uh, it basically, you have this linear model. And so uh, if you happen to like one of the features that you, you learn out of this factorization model, then, well, how much you like an item is going to increase kind of without bound as more and more of that feature becomes present. So I think in this kind of a context, it's sort of clear that that probably doesn't make sense in a lot of cases, right? So if, you know, I, maybe I like some amount of sugar or some amount of, of milk in my coffee, but it's certainly not a monotonic function of how much sugar you add. Like it, there's definitely a point where it becomes, uh, becomes much worse than, than having maybe no sugar at all. Um, okay. The other, uh, yeah, I, I guess I'll, I'm sure. So, okay, the, the, this is kind of a, a, maybe a slightly cooked up example, uh, but there are, okay, so recommendation systems, there are a lot of other uh, sort of more uh, common applications of recommendation systems. Uh, and one thing that I, I kind of want to emphasize is that, right, so in all of this, the way I've been describing this problem is we're going to get to see which of these, so, you know, we're trying to learn this point, and what we're going to do is we're going to give, give me two different drinks and ask me to taste them both and decide which one I like, I like better. So that's one way of collecting feedback from the users. You could also ask me to give it a rating. Uh, people actually tend to not like to give numerical ratings to things, so there's sort of some reason to be biased towards actually directly uh, requesting these kinds of comparisons where we explicitly ask people which of these two things do you prefer. Uh, but I want, what I want to kind of emphasize is that you may not think about it, but these kinds of paired comparisons are kind of implicitly collected in almost any website that you interact with all of the time, right? So if you think about how you use Netflix, so Netflix is always giving you strange categories of, and, and being like, you know, so here's some movies that share some common theme. Where they come up with them is a little unclear to me. Uh, so this is a screenshot, uh, not from me, but this is a, an actual movie category that Netflix has. So this is movies with cool mustaches, I guess. Uh, and <laughs> and uh, right, so, so when you are presented with something like this, it may or may not be actually personalized to you, but it is some list of uh, movies. And when you're interacting with the website, you will see these movies, and you will click on some, or you, you, know, you might hover your mouse on it. Uh, and you will probably just skip over most of them. And so that kind of interaction, you know, or if, you're, if you do a Google search, or if, whenever you're searching for items, it's, you know, you, they're presenting a list, you select one of them. And so you do get this kind of implicit uh, paired comparison. So you're saying, well, this one is at least somewhat more relevant to, to my interest than the others. Uh, so, so I'll talk, so this yeah. Is not a paired yeah. So yeah, yeah. So this is more than yeah. So one, and I'm not gonna. Uh, I'm gonna focus on kind of the simplest example where we only have two uh, at a time. You could think of this as you know. I guess we have six items, and so if I actually selected one over the other six, you could think of that as saying that's actually giving us like five compar paired comparisons at once. Although there may be other ways of thinking about that. Yeah, so here we're, we're in, yeah, yeah, yeah. Although they, if you were Netflix, you could control mm -hmm. what you present to people. Yeah. Uh, is your choice yeah. of the successive pairs adaptive or? So we'll talk about that. I, I mean, uh, I'll, I'll describe kind of what's possible under certain model where they're not adaptive. And we'll see that there are some limitations in doing it that way and that you can get big gains by doing something adaptively. You're working with a Euclidean metric here. Is that necessary, or is? Uh, I mean, it's. It, I don't know that it is necessary, but yeah, yeah it's, it's probably not. But yeah, I don't know. There, there would definitely be some some changes to to be made in, in what I'm going to say here in in a minute. Yeah. Is the uh, existence of a finite list of possible points important, or could you phrase it just in terms of selecting any hyperplane you like? 
Uh, if you could select any hyperplane you like, I think that uh, it becomes an easier problem. So, uh, but yeah, well, I think I'll, I'll kind of cover all of these in, in a little bit more time. So, um, so briefly, I'm, I am going to kind of focus on, on this application sort of mentally just to kind of keep this in mind uh, as, as a potential motivation. Uh, there are other contexts where these kinds of uh, localization from these sorts of paired comparisons uh, could be useful. So I'll talk a little bit later on about, about non-metric multidimensional scaling, which is just where you have a bunch of points and you want to learn an embedding into some low dimensional space uh, based on rather than, so traditional multidimensional scaling is where you actually get to measure the distances. Uh, you have some sort of real value that tells you how close points are. Uh, and in non-metric multidimensional scaling, that's where you uh, just have sort of ordinal statements about which points are closest to each other. You know, these, these points are closer to each other than these other two points. And uh, so some of what I have to say is relevant there. Um, and then also, you know, I, I haven't really found a super compelling, uh, in my mind, application where you actually just want to do this to localize something in, in physical space. But that, that could be, I could, I could imagine, you know, if you didn't have GPS, there might be some scenarios where you could uh, have some fixed set of beacons that you know the locations of, and you can, maybe it's easier to directly just decide which one's closest as opposed to uh, actually measuring the distances. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. Although I think usually you can get more information than just which of these two things are closer. So if you can get more information, you can probably do better, although uh, maybe not. Well, we'll see. Um, OK, so let me kind of state this problem a little bit more mathematically precisely. So the, int the problem I'm interested in is how well we can estimate this, this vector x. Uh, and I want to kind of contrast a little bit of what I'm going to say with uh, some existing results. So there's a, there's a, a lot of literature on um, Basically, how do you learn a ranking from comparisons of this sort? Some of which, so the most closely related is, is work by Jameson and, and Nowak, uh, where they looked at a very similar model where you assume the points live in some low dimensional space and uh, can argue that this gives you uh, kind of improved bounds in terms of query complexity. How many of these comparisons do you need to, to do this? Although, um, so their, their perspective is more of like you want to just learn an ordering of of the items. And I'm just going to be looking at this from a slightly different perspective, which is actually how well can we actually estimate this, this vector x. So if you, in, in some sense, you might be able to, you, you can relate the two of them, but they're not exactly the same thing. Um, I'm going to assume throughout the, the talk that the kind of, uh, so the, the only assumption I'm going to make on x is that it's bounded, essentially, that, that, that it lives in a Euclidean ball of some, some radius. Uh, otherwise, I'm not going to make any structural assumptions on it, like that it's sparse or, or has other kind of structure, although you could probably incorporate that if you wanted to. Uh, and then uh, my goal is going to be to say, OK, well, how many of these paired comparisons do I need uh, to be sure that we can obtain an estimate x hat that's, say, within epsilon uh, of x? And I am going to be measuring this in the Euclidean norm. OK. so. Uh, one, I guess one more thing I should say before I kind of get to the specific model I'm going to use is, is that there's kind of a nice compact way of representing these observations as single bits, which is to basically say what we're going to do is we're actually going to compute the sign of the difference between these two distances, or distances squared. Uh, so in this case, it would be 1 if we measure uh, pi to be closer, so this distance would be bigger. Uh, than the other, and then it would be negative one if, if qi was closer. And when we do this, right, so if, if, if we write out our model, then uh, we realize kind of there's a lot of cancellations that happen here, and if you just go through the algebra, uh, what you get is this uh, kind of expression here, which uh, basically says, okay, if I look at the two points, the, the vector between them, that kind of tells us uh, the direction of. Uh, so this is a, just a linear measurement. We're going to take x. We're going to project it onto a vector in this direction. Uh, and then we have some threshold that we add to that. And we get to observe this 
this single bit. Okay, so I'll, I think I won't come back to this uh, again, but, but basically a much uh, kind of a simpler, I'll just represent this direction and threshold with vectors ai and a, tau I, or, and a number tau i uh, to keep things a little bit more compact going forward. Okay, so, so if we want to talk about how well we can estimate x, it's, it's kind of going to greatly depend on what these ai's and tau i's look like. Uh, so if we have just a fixed set of points, we're going to have to pick points to, we're either going to have to pick them ourselves uh, in, some, in some way, uh, or we could, yeah, we could do things adaptively or non-adaptively, but either way, we're going to be somewhat limited in what kind of directions we have available to, our, available to us and what kind of tau's we can, we can work with. And so to get a rough idea of what might be possible, I'm going to kind of assume that we don't have a finite set of points, but uh, have access to kind of arbitrary choices for ai and tau i. Uh, and I think there are lots of things you could actually do here. Uh, I'm going to analyze this problem under the case where uh, the ai's and the tau i's, uh, or well, I guess where, where these are generated at random. And the model that I'm going to use is where uh, basically the two points, so we'll just imagine to get a feeling for what's possible, that these two points we're going to compare to are generated uh, as IID Gaussian random vectors uh, and see what happens. So basically, if we do that, you can kind of show that when you appropriately renormalize the problem, what we're doing is we're taking x and we're computing an inner product with a vector that's uniform on the sphere. And then we have some normal, uh, some, so it turns out this, this offset is also uh, a Gaussian random, or a, a Gaussian number. Uh, and the, that the AIs and the, this AI and tau i are independent of each other. Um, it was not obvious to me for quite a long time that these two things are independent, because uh, they seem like they depend on a lot of the same things. But uh, you can kind of show that that's, uh, that's true, I won't, I won't focus on why. So, okay, so this is basically the problem that we have. So if we assume this normal model, then what we're saying is we want to estimate a vector x from random observations of this form. Uh, and this has actually already received a lot of attention in recent years and in the context of, of what's called one-bit compressive sensing. So uh, in one-bit compressive sensing, basically we have uh, some vector x Typically, it's actually assumed to be a high-dimensional vector that's sparse, but you could apply all of these results in the case where it's, it's just a, a low-dimensional vector to begin with. Uh, and you get these one-bit observations, and you want to go from the observations uh, to get some estimate of, of x. And the, there's kind of uh, two category of, uh, categories of results where people have really looked at this a lot. So the first category is where these AIs are Gaussian or they could be uniform on the sphere. Uh, and then the tau i's are 0. So there's no offset. And so this was kind of the first problem people looked at. And, and so there's a lot of work on it. But it's actually a really hard problem uh, because when you think about what, what you could even say here. So if there's no tau i, right, you're only observing these, the sign of these uh, projections from x onto a hyperplane that goes through the origin. You're basically observing which side of that these, these hyperplanes x lands on. Uh, and they all go through the origin. So there's no way you could ever even say anything about the normalization of x. You've completely lost any scaling information, right? So you could multiply x by a million. It wouldn't actually change any of your measurements. So there's kind of no way of, of getting that piece of information back. So then you know people, the kind of earlier work on it was saying what we need to do is we need to just reconstruct something that lives on the sphere. But now I have a non-convex optimization problem that is hard to work with. Um, there are convex optimization problems that give similar guarantees. But they're all stated in terms of sort of recovering the angle uh, uh, that x has. Uh, but then kind of very recently, there, there's been a little bit of work uh, where people looked at the case where tau i was not equal to 0. Uh, and uh, so both of these papers, I would say, that there's kind of two messages that uh, I think are important. So one is that when, when tau i is not 0, so if you now have this additional degree of freedom, you can figure out 
what the scaling is. You're no longer limited in terms of uh, what's possible to say about x. You can just try to actually reconstruct x to high accuracy. Uh, and the other thing that kind of comes up, especially in this uh, second paper, is that if you have this additional freedom, you can do something potentially adaptive and get big performance gains. Uh, and we'll see that something similar happens uh, in, in our setup. Uh, none of, neither of these sort of families of results kind of directly apply. They, they, I can't just take their theorems and apply them, but kind of similar techniques uh, can, can be used. I'm not going to focus on them. I'll just say what, what, what we can say in the end. So suppose we, what, what we get m comparisons under this model. Uh, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick a particular variance for this sigma is, is the variance that uh, is the, the variance involved in uh, choosing the, the points we're comparing to. So the P and Q in our, in our comparison model are, are Gaussian with this particular variance. And I'm setting it to be something specific and saying that when we set sigma, when we set the variance appropriately, then what we can say is that essentially for any x hat that agrees with our observations, uh, we have that x hat um, minus x is less than epsilon with probability at least 1 minus eta. Uh, I should have quickly changed it to delta to agree with the last um, talk. So with probably at least 1 minus delta provided that the number of measurements we see is, is uh, basically proportional to r over epsilon times uh, a factor that's basically uh, you know, determined by the dimension and a log factor uh, that's probably relatively uh, tolerable, and another log factor related to the probability. Yeah? The, the threshold, I think two slides ago you showed that the threshold was 1 over pi minus qi, or something like that length. So what, yeah. what does it mean when, when the two points pi and qi are really close together? Huge yes, it does. So, so actually, I'll, I'll, I have some. I think I have a, a slide in a minute that'll give some intuition on that. But yeah, that's that is uh, that issue is kind of is a big part of why I'm saying sigma squared is being set to a particular level because it's going to kind of prevent this from from being an issue. I think. Um, so okay, yeah. So in, in particular, I say right here. Okay, so this proof. Uh, well, it doesn't, it's not that the proof falls apart, it's still true, but the results is kind of vacuous. Uh, when uh, sigma squared is extremely, sm when this variance is extremely small or extremely large. Uh, and I think there's some, some intuition for that. Uh, and I'll show that this actually does happen in practice and, and give some intuition in a second. Uh, let me just say, I guess this theorem is not really a statement about an algorithm. This is just saying if you can find a point that agrees with all of your observations, then uh, it will be good. There are lots of ways to try to actually find one of these points. Uh, this is probably, I, I won't say that, they're, that, that what I'm doing is necessarily the best from a computational perspective, although it's, it, it's also very easy. So uh, what I'll do is I'll assume, uh, OK, so uh, basically what I just said is that essentially if, if m is sufficiently large, uh, then any uh, estimate that agrees with our observations and that has norm bounded than r will, will work. So all we knew, need to do is find one of these. Uh, and a simple way to do it is to just solve this optimization problem that says find the one with the smallest norm of everything that agrees with these uh, observations. Yeah? Can you go back one slide? Yeah. So look at this expression. Does this suggest that when you have these kind of observations generated this way, that if you're seeing them online, let's say, they're coming in, is it that many times you're like, oh, uh, this alpha, this threshold, uh, going to be useless? Yes. Okay. Yes. You're kind of coupon collecting until you. Yes, yes. I think that's exactly. Until you yeah, get, yeah. Okay, this is a useful one. Yeah, yeah. Is something like that's happening. Yeah, I think that's it. That, 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 that. Yeah, I think that is exactly what's, what's happening. Um, yeah. yeah. And, and I think this, well, OK. So let me show you uh, this, this result here. So, so, um, so if I use this, this approach, I can look at how accurately I estimate in, in, in this uh, model. So I said that the, the bounds kind of suggested that the variance was going to play some important role. Uh, and 
uh, when we look at sort of what kind of reconstruction error we get uh, as a function of the variance, we do sort of see that uh, something real is happening. That there's so this is a log scale. I, I guess I lost the, the log, but basically uh, it turns out that that this level that I said was kind of the right level to set the variance is exactly where, uh, so the theory suggests this is a good choice and this is exactly where the performance uh, tends to be best. And I think the reason why is, is kind of easy to understand if you think about what's happening in these other two cases. So what happens if we set uh, the variance to be uh, extremely small? So if they're very small, that's, that basically means we're drawing points from some Gaussian density that's extremely concentrated around the origin. So that's kind of the, the example that you were talking about first. So if all the points are really close to each other, and we're saying, OK, we believe our, the point we're trying to estimate lives inside of this sphere, and every, com every pair of points that we're comparing to is kind of like at the origin. So of every line, the, or all of our observations are just going to look like this. It's actually reducing to this, this uh, case where all the taus are essentially 0. Uh, so I know you said they were really big, but that's because I was renormalizing everything in that formula. So in the kind of the in the original formulation, the taus would all be very close to zero. Um, and so okay, so we kind of know things are going to be hard in this case uh, because all you're ever going to know is kind of which slice of the pie you you uh, you lived in. Uh, the other case is uh, maybe more like what you were actually suggesting. So if the variance is very large then uh, it's going to be very likely that most of the, uh, of the hyperplanes that you generate actually don't even intersect with uh, the region where you think your point might live. Right? And so uh, I think this kind of suggests that just choosing things according to a, a Gaussian density, I mean, it might be OK for a while, but once you've been doing this for a while, you have enough information that you're kind of in this situation where most of the these hyperplanes are probably not giving you anything new. Uh, and it kind of suggests, I think, uh, if you're willing, if you, if you can generate points according to this Gaussian density, it suggests a very simple adaptive scheme, I think, which, uh, uh, which should do better, right? So uh, basically what we're saying here, uh, right, so this is kind of a simpler form of what we're, uh, of what the result says we need to, um, we need to achieve. Basically, uh, all right, so the, I'm stating it in terms of, of how many measurements you need to get a recovery error. You could also say, right, so how does epsilon de decay as m grows? It's roughly 1 over m. Um, and so to achieve very small errors, m, you might have to think, would, uh, would be very, very large. Uh, and so um, we kind of know we should be able to do better by doing something adaptive. So the approach that I'm going to take us to say, well, what if epsilon, what if we just set epsilon to be r over 2? So how many measurements do we need in order to cut our uncertainty in half? Uh, it doesn't really matter here. So this is what we have. If we plug in epsilon as r over 2, we just get some number that uh, it's a constant, except it depends on that constant, it depends on the dimension that we're, that we're in. So it, it's bigger if we're in a higher dimensional space. Uh, but if you just treat this as, you know, this is some uh, some constant number of comparisons we need to cut our error in half, then you could say, okay, well, after we've taken m not comparisons, uh, we've kind of cut our region of uncertainty in half, right? So we started here, and then uh, after some constant number of comparisons, so m not comparisons, we have some, new, some estimate that we can produce. And now we can say, okay, actually, well, we know that with high probability, the true x has to live within this, this radius. And so now we could still generate points from this Gaussian density, but centered on this point and with a smaller variance. And if you can continue doing this, you get a much faster rate of convergence, a uh, much quicker estimate. All right. So what I kind of like about this approach, I guess I say uh, what it is here. So this is just in words what I just described. Uh, so what is nice about this, okay, is that if we have some fixed number of measurements, so m, uh, I'm going to assume that m is you know, some factor bigger than how many measurements it takes to cut the error in half. So we run this for m over m naught iterations. 
uh, and the reconstruction error is going to basically decay exponentially fast in that, in that number in contrast to just 1 over the square root of m in the general case. So what I like about that, about this approach, is that it's very easy, even though it's all uh, stated in terms of Gaussian random vectors, it's, it's very easy to uh, adapt it to the case where you actually have uh, just some fixed set of points to choose from. There are lots of different ways you could think about uh, about doing that. And so this simulation that I'm showing here is actually uh, doing this where there's just a fixed embedding of points. And what, what, the, what we're doing is we're picking things from a Gaussian density and then just kind of you know, from those two points, what's the closest element in my point set to each of them? Uh, there are probably other ways you could, uh, you could use important sampling or do something else. Uh, this is just the first thing that occurred to us. And, and the one thing I just want to kind of point out is you, get, you do sort of see, even in that case where you have a finite set of points we're picking from, you do see this big gap that after a while, you really, the rate of improvement by doing something non-adaptive really slows down. Uh, but by introducing this adaptivity, you get bigger, uh, sort of a faster convergence to whatever the best you could do is. At some point, so we don't continue the simulation uh, much past this because if you have a finite set of points to pick from, at some point you kind of hit a resolution limit where you can't really do any better given, the, given those points. OK, so I'm, I think I'm basically out of time. So I'll skip this. I'll, I'll just say one thing I liked about the, the, the reason why we thought about this from the perspective of solving this convex optimization problem is that it's extremely sim simple to make it robust to, to noise, right? So if you have some errors, you just uh, kind of introduce some slack variables and you get something that looks like an SVM, and it, uh, it's pretty easy to, to work with. Uh, one, OK, so I have just a couple slides here. Um, I guess, is it OK if I keep going since I don't see? Uh, David, I'll just talk for the next 30 minutes. Uh, no, so, so, um, so if I go back to this problem, so I've been talking almost exclusively about localizing. Like basically, we get measurements like this, and we want to know what x is. We want to fit a user into this. So like if we have some mature recommendation system, we have some embedding of all of the items, and we just have some new user. We're trying to figure out where they go. Uh, but you could also imagine a situation where you get a new item. So there's some new movie you're going to add to this embedding, and you just maybe you don't have any other information about it that you really trust, and you want to just use these user comparisons to figure out where, where it goes. Uh, so you might think that, the, that it's kind of a similar problem. It turns out that if these are the observations that you're getting, this, and, and you're trying to think of, uh, say you know, uh, I guess, x and qy, so you know some, the user, where the user is, and you know where the other point is, and you want to estimate pi. Uh, this is giving you a very different kind of uh, information. So if y, yi is 1, you're basically saying uh, that uh, pi lives inside of a sphere of some given radius. But if yi is negative 1, it's actually that it lives outside of a sphere of a certain radius. And so this is kind of a, this is fine actually, but this is a, uh, an ugly constraint to work with. Uh, and so there are lots of things you might be able to do, but we realized uh, kind of shortly after realizing this was the case, uh, that there's a sort of a simple way to convexify this problem by basically involving, looking at pairs of comparisons. The only trick is we need different users. Uh, and if we have two different users that have both compared this, this item uh, p to two points, these don't need to be the same. Uh, so q1 and q2 could be totally different. Uh, and where p is landed on sort of opposite sides of those, those two inequalities, uh, then you can kind of basically just add those two inequalities together. You get a linear, uh, a linear constraint. Uh, the picture is basically that, uh, so this, this is useful sometimes to do. So the picture that I have in mind is that uh, you thought you, so this is the constraint that says I live inside of a sphere. Then I live outside of this one, so the constraints that I'm working with is this weird Pac-Man shape. Uh, and what this process is doing is basically saying, I'm just going to linearize this, seemingly throw away a ton of information. Uh, but it turns out you know, there are so many of these kinds of constraints that when you combine them, it, it works pretty well. You can use the exact same algorithm. You can get similar results. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so I was going to kind of mention with this, now that if we can actually do both users and items separately, 
there's sort of a simple way of using this to do really large scale, multi-dimensional scale, non-metric multi-dimensional scaling. And the, the algorithm is to basically do something kind of sophisticated, like solve a semi-indefinite program to uh, learn the location of some core set. This is not a core set. This is like, that's why I've been quotes. So I just mean like some subset of the users and items. And then once you have a kind of a good representative subset of all of them, you can kind of just localize all the remaining users and items one at a time uh, using this approach and maybe iterate if you want. Uh, you, and we actually looked at just ignoring this first step altogether and just choosing a random starting point and kind of iterating all over all of them. And, and even that actually works surprisingly well. So, okay. So I won't even, I won't, I'll just go ahead and, and finish. Um, if there are any questions, maybe I'll field those while uh, David gets set up. Computational geometry, there's this idea of arrangements of hyperplanes and how many cells they produce and so on, right? And yeah. basically what you're doing with your fixed set of points is considering the arrangement formed by all the bisecting hyperplanes mm -hmm. that are their points and asking yourself what cell is your X located in, that's what you're asking. Yeah. So there's both kind of combinatorial results to talk about the number of cells that can be created by N hyperplanes and maybe, or, I don't know, yeah. 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 Queries you need to converge on the cell, I mean, to zoom in on the cell, I don't know. Yeah, so what I'm not familiar with is uh, is how you would say something. So if you're just given a fixed set of points and you want to know, like it seems to me like if you wanted to get a uniform result that says no matter where x is in this space, uh, I can get a good estimate of x. Uh, I don't know. It seems like you'd have to make some additional assumptions on the properties of that set of points. And I, I guess I haven't come across anything that Kind of does a good job, but yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, but I do, and, and maybe I was not super clear at this at the beginning. But like, I do think that there's probably algorithmically a lot, a lot there, right? So if you, you know, p people must have looked at this at this kind of problem before from a maybe not trying to understand it from this perspective of how big is the diameter of the kind of largest cell that's formed, but. Certainly, like just finding x very efficiently and in real time is probably. One of them is actually higher quality information. Like, it might be not, it might not be convex. It might be ugly, but is it actually more informative? I think it is. Yeah, yeah. So, and, and in fact, we found that even when we, so when we did this convexification, uh, and I don't really have a good intuition for this, but like, it seemed like we actually needed fewer comparisons to get a good localization of the item. It's probably on the order of a constant. I mean, I don't. But it actually, that, that works better than localizing the user, even after we've done this convexification process, which is throwing away tons of information. So I do think that there might be, I don't know how to exploit that. Uh, do you think it changes the scaling? Do you have this kind of one over yeah, it could be. Scaling, it's possible. Like, do you think it Maybe, yeah, I don't, I don't know. Questions? 